John chapter 4. Uh, if you haven't been here in a while, if you're new, uh, I've been preaching in a series that I've entitled Finding Value in the Journey. And I hope by now this is uh, week five. This will be the last week of this series. Uh, I guess I'm going to land the plane, so to speak, today. And uh, I hope you found value in the things that God is doing in your life. Uh, if not, you got one more opportunity to do so in this series. John chapter 4, starting in verse number 25. Are you there? Yes. Four people. We'll wait. There, amen. All right. Here's what the Bible says. We pick up this story in verse 25. The Bible says, The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled. Turn your neighbor and say marveled. marveled. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Amen. They went out of the town and were coming to Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. One more passage of scripture. You don't have to turn there, but we'll put it up on the screen. Exodus 15, verse 11. The Bible says this, who is like you? O Lord, among the gods, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. I, uh, uh, I titled my message today, Who is Like Him? So if you're taking notes today, which you should, because you're in church and you should write stuff down, write, write it down. Who is like him? Who is like him? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the, and the med meditations of my heart, God, be acceptable in your sight. Father, as we, as we seek you, Lord, in the word, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us exactly where we need to be met, that you would change hearts, God, that you would cause people to look up. Your word says that you're the lifter of our heads, so I pray, God, that people's heads would be lifted, that people would find encouragement, God, that can only come from you. We honor you, and we thank you, and Lord... Let the Lakers sign LeBron today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Looking out for you, bro. We stick together, us L.A. folk. Hey, uh, um, who is like him? You know, if there was a people in any time period that would know the works of God, it would have been the children of Israel. They, you know, as I... As, as just to give you a little bit of context in Exodus 15, these dudes literally came out of 10 plagues watching God do something. 10. 10 times where he moved with a mighty hand. And right before, um, they, this is actually part of a song of Moses, but right before they went to go sing and they broke out into like a little mini musical during their escape from, from Egypt, uh, God parted the Red Sea. And I don't know about you, we, we read about this stuff, but you could look at this and, and picture it in your mind. Can you imagine walking through the middle of dry land, you know, kind of like you'd be in an aquarium or something like that, seeing whales and sharks off to your right and to your left? You'd probably bust into song too. And one of the things that they said during this passage was, who is like you, O Lord? If you've had any kind of experience with God, God will always cause you to scratch your head and go, man, there's nobody like you. None. Amen. It doesn't matter what twists and turns your life uh, have taken. Most of the time, you will always come out right on top if you're yielded and submitted and following God. These people, the children of Israel, knew by experience and they sang from experience. Sometimes we will take somebody else's word at face value and we just kind of go do what they do and sing because they sing. And you don't really have a genuine personal experience with God. And today I, wanna, I want you to be able to answer the question, who is like him for yourself? I know what my grandma says. I know what my mom says about God. But just like Jesus posed a question to his disciples, what do you say? 
I think sometimes when you come back to that moment in your life and you revisit that, it will push you further than you, you thought you could go. Those moments when you're feeling tired and you feel like I'm worn out. And gosh, I'm so weary, Lord. What is going on? I, you know, I, I can see you doing good things, but who is like you, really? And the moment that you put yourself in that space, I call it the space of wonder. Once you put yourself back in the space of wonder, you will come to a realization that God is moving so much on your behalf. You know, I'm of the belief that the greatest miracles don't often look like miracles. That's just my personal perspective of miracles. The greatest miracles don't often look like miracles. I'll give you an example. You know, like in 2013, like I had literally, like I, I used to sell real estate. And so uh, this is coming out of the, you know, the Nevada real estate depression, so to speak. You know, things are really, really bad in the housing market. I hadn't sold a house in like forever. My, my, my savings was depleted. You know, I, I, I was working at my old job that I used to work at that I went back to, um, you know, after being successful in, in real estate. And 2013 comes along, and I had no, like, frame of mind, to de nor desire to want to buy a house. And my wife said, hey, babe, we should go buy a house. I'm like, ugh. No. You know, you, you, you ever get that feeling where, you know, you feel like you're revisiting an old pain that you don't want to go visit anymore? Like, no, leave that alone. We lost our house, remember? You know, we got the scars, look. And, 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 but she said, and, you know, when she says, <laughs> she's got like the Jedi mind trick, <laughs> house by we will, you know? And, and so I was like, okay, fine, you know? And so we went, I didn't think we'd get approved. We went and got approved. I'm like, whoa, you know, we got approved. That's, that's incredible. And so we were looking for houses and they gave us a small like dollar amount. And, you know, this is all you can afford to buy to stay at the a payment that you've been in or that you'd like to. And so we started looking. And then and when we were looking, you know, there was nothing in the area that I that we thought we should live in. We wanted to be in a specific area of Henderson, like to the street. I was like, I want to be off this street, God. And I felt God said, OK. I was like, OK, cool. So we looked over there. Everything there was twice the amount of what we wanted. And after a while, I got discouraged. After a while, we started, like, you know, moving away from where we thought we should be. We started compromising a little bit. Well, maybe not that street. Let's go a couple streets down. Maybe not that street. Let's go even further down. And the next thing you know, we were looking in places where we didn't want to really be. But it seemed like we were just trying to buy a house for the sake of buying a house. And so... You know, there was so much compromise that Sarah and I actually came to agreement. I pulled the Jedi mind trick on her. And I said, babe, let's not look at houses for 21 days. And, you know, you know the time period when a house would go on the market and boom, it was gone, right? And that, like, as soon as they list it, it was that time. And she's like, but honey, we will never find a house that way. I was like, well, we need to just trust God. So we stopped looking. 21 days. Day 18 comes. And then... Uh, I get a phone call from my brother-in-law say, saying, hey, you know, we're, we're looking to go, uh, we're going to go look at a house that we were thinking about buying, but it's too big for us. I don't want it. Do you want to look at it? It's not on the market yet. And then I go, well, where's it at? And he told me that it was off the street that we were exactly looking for. And I said, babe, we're going to go look at a house today. She's like, yeah, but it's 18 days, honey. It's not 21 days. My wife is, a, if you know my wife, she's very black and white. You say 21, it's 21. Not 21.2, not 20.5, it's 21. I said, yeah, but honey, our house is ready. And you know, you know how, I could be like the most powerful man of God in the history of men. And she would just kind of look at me like, okay. So we go. And then I literally, this is how confident I was and this is how, 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 how I felt the situation was anointed. I walk up to the house, and my nephew was climbing on the tree and hanging on one of the branches. And I told him, dude, get off my tree. And then he was like, yeah, but I thought we were buying this house. Nope, this is my house, boy. <laughs> Needless to say, 
That was the house that God had for us. As soon as we walked in, you just kind of knew. And here's how I knew, is that a week into being under contract, they said, hey, you know what? The appraisal doesn't come quite to the amount that you thought you were getting it for, and we were getting it for a deal. They said, we have to lessen the price by $5,000. Within the first week of us being under contract, you know? Like I was really gonna go, oh, really? Shucks, I don't want it anymore. No. No, I was like, okay, you know? <laughs> okay, you know? And so we got that house. Some of you might look at that and go, gosh, it's a miracle. And you know, that is. But to me, the greatest miracle out of all of that was that my brother-in-law called me. The greatest miracle was that my brother-in-law, who had no idea we were fasting houses for 21 days, who had no idea that we wanted to live off of that street, called me and said, we're about to go look at a house that we don't want. Think about that for a second. Out of the blue, you call somebody and go, hey, we're about to look at a house that we don't really want. To me, I'd be like, well, why are you going to go look at the house? But for him, it was like, you know what? Something tells me that I need to go call Dodgel, because if I call Dodgel, and I, I'm just going to say, hey, you, you might want this house. And that was the house that we, we still live in, and that's the house that we want. The greatest miracles don't often look like miracles. If you go in the Bible, sometimes you look at the book of Jonah and you think, oh, well, he got, he, got, he got swallowed up by a big old fish. That's a miracle. To me, the miracle starts in verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. God spoke to Jonah. The fact that God still speaks to people is a miracle in itself. You can't keep looking at the home run miracles because with God, everything is a home run miracle. Every single thing that he does is a miracle. Every single thing that he does causes you to pause and wonder, who is like God? Nobody. There is absolutely nobody. You could take the Pepsi challenge to Buddha, whoever. I will take my God every single time. Every single thing that God does is, is one of those things like Arsenio Hall used to talk about, things that make you go, hmm. Hmm. That's just crazy. There's times in my life where I was two cars away from a car accident. I was like literally turning left someplace, two cars in front of me, the dude turns left, boom, accident. And I sit there and go, huh, that's weird. That's crazy. When I was younger, there was a time where I was driving, I was just at a, a high school and I was driving and you know, it's just bad to drive mad. So can I just tell you right now, don't drive mad. And, and, and I, was, I was angry at something. And I was driving, and it just rained in California. You know the song goes, it never rains in Southern California. Well, it did. And so the ground was all jacked up. And I was mad, and I was driving. I was uh, taking an on-ramp to the freeway. Next thing you know, I lose control. I'm spinning around on I-10. And the next thing you know, all I see as I'm going like this is a Toyota Tundra coming right at me. And all I see it just go, <laughs> hits me head on. And I'm like spinning. I get out and some, some uh, uh, snowboarder dude was like, whoa, bro. Are you okay? And I look. All I had was a little nick on my knee. That's crazy. The greatest miracles don't often look like miracles. And I think it would behoove you as a child of God as a son or daughter of God, to look at everything as a wonder. You ever been in a delivery room when a baby's being born? Yeah. Dude, that is one of the best experiences of my life. There's nothing like new life. You could think of, oh, well, he graduated college. That's a miracle. No, him being born was a miracle. You being his dad is a miracle. God chose you to be the father of this specific child. That's a miracle. In my life, you know, my daughter, who is not truly my own daughter, is my own daughter because God made it to be that way. Amen. That is a miracle. God said, you know what? I know it's not working out with your father right now, but I'm going to give you somebody that's going to be a father to you. Yeah. That's a miracle that my child would grow up having a father. It's the same thing that happened with my son. Hey. I'm giving you a mom to have in your life during this time of your development. That is a miracle. With your spouse, you keep thinking, okay, we'll have date night or we'll go on family vacation. That will be the miracle. That's not the miracle. The miracle is you embracing your children and your spouse every single day of your life. 
if you keep yourself in the place of wonder, you will always discover the God that is wonderful. But you have to keep yourself there. The disciples come back from this story. And if you're, if you're new to the story, John chapter 4 is about a woman from Samaria, from an area of Samaria called Sychar. She was a throwaway. She was, uh, by all accounts, of what we call a sinner. The Bible says that she's had five husbands. And she was coming to draw from the well, trying to hide from everybody. Because she came at a time when nobody was at the well. But Jesus was. Sometimes when you go to places where you think you're going to be by yourself, you, those are the places that God is going to meet you, my friend. It's in the places of solitude that you choose to walk in. God will meet you in that space. And sometimes the very thing that you need to hear is the thing that he speaks. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's, it's hard. But it's always going to lead you towards him. She comes and she has a moment with him. She got to ask him questions, and he responded and talked to her, not like she was some second-class citizen or some throwaway, but he responded to her and spoke with her out of love. And someone who, and he valued her when he spoke to her. And in verse 25, we pick this whole story up, and she tries to, to flash this, this knowledge that she thinks she has about God to what she thought was a rabbi or someone of that stature. And she goes, well, I know when the Messiah comes, he's going to tell us all kinds of stuff. And Jesus just breaks it down to her right there. Mic drop moment says, I am he. <laughs> and the disciples come. They went to go buy food. They went to go get some in and out real quick, and then they came back. You know, the line was kind of long. So they come back, and they bring him some food. And the Bible says when they saw him talking to this woman, they marveled. If you look it up in the Greek, it actually means they wondered. They looked at him in awe. What is he doing talking to this girl? Mind you, in that time, they didn't talk to women in public. Mind you, in that time, let alone sinners, let alone a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan. That does not happen in those times. But here he is talking to her. Here he is having a conversation with her. And they stopped and they marveled. It is my belief that that's the reason why guys like Peter could go to Cornelius and, and talk to Gentiles because they saw the Savior talking to people that they should not talk to. That's why I believe Philip had this crazy revival moment thing happen in Samaria because they knew that Jesus would go talk to those kind of people, that there was nobody that was not covered by the gospel of Jesus. That maybe if you're sitting here today and you're wondering, well, does that include me? Yes, it includes you. Everything that God does includes you. The devil wants to shame you into thinking that, no, it's not for me. I don't know if church is for me. Yes, it's for you. All we are is a bunch of imperfect people looking at a perfect God. Yes. The dude next to you isn't more holier than you. He's just as much of a human being just as you are. Yep. Some have more hair, some don't. It's all good. <laughs> but no matter what you think, no matter what you, you, you think that's happened to your life, God still cares and he still, he still loves to have conversations with his children. You know, there's so many things that happen in the rhythms of my life where I feel like when my kids come, you know, I have to challenge myself and go, this is not an interruption. This is not an interruption. I need to go talk to my kid. He's only eight once. You know, we went to a comic book convention uh, yesterday, and, you know, don't judge me. I go to comic book conventions. <laughs> and so we went to a comic book convention, and we were walking around. And I, I'm telling you, as weird as that may be for you, I'm hanging out with my kids and my brother. It was time with them. This is a moment that they will, hey, Dad, remember that one time when I was eight and we met the actor for Daredevil? Yep, I sure do. Why? Because I was present. The God who, who is in love with you is present with you. Here's the thing that they saw. These disciples saw a man and a woman, a man, a, a woman and Jesus having a quote-unquote transaction. But the woman saw it differently. I think it's so weird that you and I choose to have transactions with God, but we fail to omit and, and we fail to, to have conversation with God. 
We're so bent on wanting to have a transaction with God. God, can you just bless my finances, add a couple more zeros to it? God, can you heal this person because he's not feeling good? Lord, can you help me get a new job? You engage God for a transaction. He just wants a conversation. What about just talking to God about your day? It's rough, God. Those kids are mean. Lord Jesus, please get them saved. They were thinking that he was having a transaction with her when all she knew was that the Savior of the world was conversing with me. He was talking with me. He was speaking with me. And when you treat God like you want to have a conversation with him, why? Because who is like our God? He's majestic in holiness. He's the only God. He's the God of wonders. He's the God of miracles. He's the God that would part Red Seas. He's the God that would cure your husband. He's the God that would heal your husband from anger. He's the God that would save your children. He's the God that no matter how far your kids have gone, they're always going to come back because of what you've taught them. The neat thing is that she goes and has a conversation with him. And as soon as she has a conversation with him and a moment with him, she leaves. And she goes. And she leaves her very own water pot that she brought over there. I can imagine this girl carrying a water pot and, and putting it in front of her and whoever was watching her walk. In the Philippines, they do that. They have, you know, um, they, they, they fill water pots or pails or buckets from a well, and they take it back to their house. And when you don't want to talk to people, they'll usually put on the shoulder, and if you're over there, they'll put you know, the, the, the pail or the bucket in between them and you so they don't have to talk to you. She used it like a shield for a relationship. I don't want to talk to nobody. I just want to go get my water and get back to the, to the house. After a moment with Jesus, the Bible says that she left her water pot behind. The thing that she was using to hold on to her shame, she left it behind. The thing that she was using to shield her from relationship, she left it behind. The thing that, that, that she used to, 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 to just have an excuse to not be able to talk to anybody, she left all of that behind. And here's the thing. When you have a conversation with God, God does not give you five points to change. He just causes you to run in a different direction and the, who you used to be gets left behind. God does not go, okay, hey, you want to have a talk? Okay, cool. Well, here's what you need to change about yourself first, okay? First, you need to shave because that thing is ugly. And then two, you need to go change your clothes. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He just tells you, hey, look, I'm here. I'm here for you. You are my child. I take ownership of you so much so that I will give my son. So much so that it will cost me my son and his life to be able to have a relationship with you. That is the God that's, that you serve. Who is like him? Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Public service announcement for Sunday, July 1st, 2018. There's nobody like God. Amen. I saw a shirt that said, ain't no high like the most high. <laughs> Drop that doobie, homie. There's a God that loves you, and he's better than that. Stop hiding behind that thing that's, you know, we use those mechanisms sometimes so that we feel like we can fit in. You fit in just fine with God. Amen. You fit in just fine. Amen. Leave it behind. Start walking towards him, and watch he will change you. Just a conversation with him is the very thing that changes you. And she was changed so much so that she left who she, she hid behind behind. Is that even proper English, behind, behind? I don't know. <laughs> but she left it behind. There's some things I believe that you just need to leave behind. I want to go pursue God, and I, I just, I feel God is so real, and I just need to go, I just need to go after him. But can I bring this with me? No, leave it behind. Just leave it behind. Whatever you leave behind, he will fill with something better. Amen. She leaves and the Bible says she goes into the town. The very people she was trying to hide from, she goes into them. There was no like, okay, well, now that you believe in me, there's five points of evalu uh, evangelism that you need to understand. Okay, we need to do this, this, this. No, 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 no. 
All she did was she just, she met the Savior face to face. He did not rebuke her. He did not condemn her. And she just all of a sudden became zealous for him. And she goes into the town. And she says, come see. I love words like that in the Bible. Come see. Well, I don't know if God is for me. Oh, yeah, well, come see. I don't know if he's going to do this. Come see. You know, in some Hebrew talk, that they would say that to repent means to look again at Jesus. Look again. Maybe you saw what your grandma saw. But what did you see? Because I believe that when you go into the place of wonder, you will discover who you truly are because you will find out who he really is. And when you go into that place and you find that place and you, you see God, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is the Christ and that is the Messiah. She says, come see. Come see a man who taught me, who told me everything that I've ever done. And she says, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that was foretold from long ago? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the author and the finisher of our faith. Could this be him? She went out to the very people that she was ashamed of, and she wasn't ashamed anymore. All you need is a conversation with God. And trust me, he will change you. Isn't that what we all want? I just want to be different. I'm tired of doing things this way. I know how this record plays out if I keep going. I just I want a new song. And God will give you a new song. God will give you a new path. Sometimes he'll tell you go back to the path that you're on, but just different you. And that's enough. And that's okay. If the greatest miracles don't look like miracles, what if it's just you showing up to church every single Sunday? Start there. And then you go, you know what? I want to get more involved. Then get involved. Maybe God's telling you, man, I really need to get baptized. Then July 29th, we got a date for you already, homie. Just go do it now. Come see. Turn in your and say, come see. come see. And the Bible says that they all came to him. Ryan, will you come up and play so that I sound spiritual up here? The Bible says that at her word, they all came to him. Sometimes the place of discovery in your life is just that you need to hear him say what, he, what you need to hear. Now, you know how many times in the Old Testament God will give an introduction of himself? He would say things like, Behold, I am the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would give this. Sometimes you just need to hear that. I am God, and there's no one like me. Yeah, I know you're trying to make a lot of money, but I'm more than money. Yeah, I know you're pursuing success and all these things. And you might win at that, but you'll always feel empty. There's no one like me. None. Turn to your neighbor and say, for Monday. For Monday. If you're new to our church and you're wondering what that means, I just believe that everything that we do on Sunday ought to bleed into your Monday. What good is what I preach and what good is what, what you hear from God if you can't implement it into your Monday? So for Monday, turn to your other neighbor and say, for Monday. Monday. Two words, come see. come see. Come see for yourself. What does that mean? I don't know, maybe you need to crack open that Bible that's been on your bookshelf for a long time. Maybe you need to open that app that's been on your phone for a while because you said you were going to start, but you didn't. Go see for yourself. The Bible says the grass withers, the flower may fade, but the word of God lasts forever. It stands forever. The Bible says that, 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 uh, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus is the word of God. Maybe you just need to go look for Jesus in that book that you, you have. Go see for yourself. Maybe you need to come to church, not because your parents dragged you to church, but maybe you just need to come for yourself to go see for yourself. Maybe you need to go get baptized so that you could truly, truly know what it's like to become a new creation in Christ. Go see. Maybe, maybe, you know, we have a few weeks left for summer small groups. Maybe you just need to join a small group so that you could be with people. 
I always say, what God starts in a row, he perfects in a circle. Go circle around some people. You know, but I don't know a whole lot. That's okay. You'll find out that they don't know much neither. <laughs> but they're worshiping and pursuing the God that knows everything. And that's what matters. Will you stand with me, church?